Good afternoon, and I guess for some people, good evening. Um, here we are, the emotional, and I know it's called the fitness factor, but you know, Jeff and I in private discussions have renamed it to emotional health factor, which is the fourth one of the month. And this one, this one pushed me. The reason being, uh, you'll see, is that when it comes to the concept of emotions, I think a lot of people in the health industry, I want to say dismiss because that may be a gross exaggeration or an assumption, but the degree of importance placed upon these things opens up a Pandora's box that I find yields more questions within people than sometimes there are answers because emotions are complex things. And, you know, I was thinking about how to introduce this one as I was driving back home. And the universe is a funny thing in the way it, it shows you little signs and tests you here and there. I was driving on the the 275 back into St. Petersburg and it was trafficy. There was a guy who in his in his pickup truck was pretty close to me and I just kind of saw this look on his face and I was going a reasonable speed in the left lane. Maybe I could have been a car length closer to the guy in front of me, but it's the beginnings of rush hour. And I see this guy just starting to like get angry. So I do the double tap on my brakes. And all of a sudden he just freaks out, arms flailing, starts screaming at me, flies ahead, tries to cut me off. And I'm just sitting there minding my own business. I'm going, hmm, my emotions are being tested right now. So the long and short of it, for all of his energy expenditure, for all of his agitation, for all of the gas he used and the brakes he used trying to get ahead of me, I still ended up getting off the off ramp with two cars ahead of him. So sometimes it just goes to show you that... Uh, Karma is, you know what, and conserving your emotions and having an awareness of your emotions in all times is something that really becomes a human superpower. Today, what I hope to expose to everyone is the importance of the concept of emotional wellness in the bigger discipline of health practice, um, because it's not something that is easily controlled with a double-blind placebo crossover study. I want to do a little bit more of a philosophical discussion today that shares some insights of what it, what it is I use not only for myself and my own journey with, with reconciling some of my, my issues from the past, but also in things that I've found to be incredibly successful in these golden nuggets that have supercharged the success I get with people because you start to realize when you go deeper and deeper into the realms of science that, <clears throat> excuse me, knowing all the different mechanisms of action and the physiologic interplays between different things is invaluable because you can see patterns in a way that maybe other people can't because they haven't put in the time. But you start to realize that every problem that someone presents to you is not purely physical. And what happens when you have to reconcile that that which is non-physical is a challenge that you're having to deal with. I think the only inevitability is to get a good deeper understanding about what non-physical means in the way that's tangible for us to wrap our heads around to better than prepare to support our clients. So I'm not a mental health professional. I'm not a psychotherapist, psychologist, have no specific designations, but I do a lot of reading and research. And I believe that all humans have this superpower called empathy. And I think if we can open our hearts and become more empathetic to the client and the situation the client may be presenting, you'd be surprised the lack of sticking point that you may encounter when it comes to working with someone and moving them forwards. So what is an emotion? You know, there are questions that I ask all my clients and I, I ask them before you're emotional, where was that emotion? Like, where do emotions come from? Usually they go, I don't, I don't know. And I say, when that emotion is done with you, where does that emotion go? No idea. And, and I think this is one of the most en enigmatic things about not only considering this in health, but being human is we kind of are like this transient pass through for this concept of a feeling that is tied to a specific sensation or experience inside of us. And from a, a perspective of framing things, I think this model right here is one of the best starting points because we see that if you look above the line, everything above that line, we could decree positive. Everything below that line, we could decree negative. So there very much is a black and white, a yin and yang aspect to this concept of emotions. And I think the thing that sets us apart from other creatures, because when you look at the anatomy of other animals, like they all have stomachs, digestive tracts, lungs, there's very, there's a lot of similarity. 
our ability to experience and process complex emotion and have that complex emotion influence our experience of reality is the thing that makes us very much human. And it's also the thing that I think is a huge, I don't know if I want to say a blind spot, but we'll call it an impetus in the aspect of what makes someone unwell. So the, the higher up you move on this emotional spiral into the ascending category, I think the ultimate manifestation really is love. And then anything that goes down to the bottom, the, the, the deep depths of guilt, shame, fear, stuff of that nature, there are patterns that come along with these things that are mirrored in the physiology. And that's something that I really want to introduce today. You know, so there, there's a saying that I like, it says, well, dreams and desires are of the mind, emotions feelings actually exist within the body. These are things that are very much real to us. And the hard part about emotions is if someone uses the term happiness with you in conversation, you don't know what their experience of happiness is from a feeling perspective, from an experiential aspect of things. But we use these words and we use this terminology to, to converse about all kinds of emotions, but we don't know what it really feels like to experience that in someone else. So, you know, this is what kind of awoke me to the idea that we're much more than this simple meat suit, this, this physical avatar that we go, you know, around the world with. But there's so many little clues when it comes to common colloquialisms in, in common language. Like when they say, oh, that person's hot-headed. All of you instantly know what someone who's hot-headed means. Like, oof, careful what you say, he may explode. Or when you have to do something that's a really big deal and you get those butterflies in your stomach, quote unquote, before you go on stage or before you give the performance or the, or, or the presentation, why are those there? What aspect of your physiology is generating those experiences and why is it actually happening? What's the message for you? When you hear bad news and you feel that big drop in your chest that goes into the pit of your stomach, when someone's like, oh, my heart sank when I heard that, that is the body trying to describe to you, in my opinion, that it is also a part of this experience, not only on an emotional level, but a physical level in response to specific emotions. And then it goes the opposite way. Like, why is it we want to just scream when we're on a roller coaster, for example, or when we get good news? So I look at these common terms as ways to give us hints that our physiology and that which is non-physical is really one and the same. They're very much connected. And if we stop and analyze a lot of these things that we probably throw around as common terms in our daily language, we might realize that they're actually clues for us to better understand not only humanity as a whole, but our ability of, of experience of this thing we call life. So it really is a mind-body connection. And, and what I've really reconciled is I used to think that from a physical problem, the physical symptom or the physical manifestation of disease was purely a physical origin. Oh, it was only nutritional deficiencies or, oh, it was only you know, accumulation of toxins, things of that nature. But think about what instantaneously happens to how you feel when you're delivered bad news. That changes things. And when you start to work with clients more deeply and you start to ask them a lot about the past, their experiences, the things they describe to you, if you notice how their facial expressions change, how their body language shifts, their tone of voice may change, they start to show you what really comes along with their experiences because you know, I think everyone here could correct me in saying that there is absolutely no influence that's a negative experience from feeling sick. If someone is unwell, there is an emotional causality that creates a positive feedback system in someone's you know, experience of being ill. So the illness with the negative emotions accompanied with it can drive further perpetuations and developments of those illnesses. So I think it's really important as human beings, if we want to experience our ultimate manifestation of health, that we have to learn to relate with our feelings and able to tap into our bodies so we can get ahead of these things. Because my personal philosophy is when it comes to an illness, once it's physical, that's the last area of manifestation. It's almost like there's been something brewing under the surface and it has been something that if we had an awareness of connecting into ourselves, might be something that catches our ability to go, oh, I'm being told something here. But humans, unfortunately, are really good at ignoring things. So at some point, the body needs to scream as loud as it can. So you have no choice but to listen to it. 
but that scream is in the form of some aspect of compromised physiology, compromised physiologic function, the development of something, so on and so forth. And I really like this model because if, if we bias things to a positive outcome, a positive effect in your life instantaneously has a positive feedback on negative stress. So positive effect brings down negative stress levels, which basically increases the concept of healthy behaviors and downregulates the what's called psychological or sorry, physiological activation of psychological factors. Because a lot of people don't know this, when you start to experience negative emotions, you can epigenetically express genes differently just based upon the moment of experiencing something that activates a high amount of fear or grief or negativity in any way, shape or form. So if we can use this as a tool to help our clients understand that things like frame of mind, relationship with emotions, the common experience of emotions is going to play a part in generating the momentum to either ward off the development of disease or to help someone remedy an existing disease. I think that's an incredible power because guess what? It doesn't cost anything. It's not an additional supplement. It's part of what I think the concert of this entire thing we call health really is. <clears throat> because this is the person to me. When I work with someone, I always start with a physical body because most people aren't ready for deep emotional work, nor are they ready to take on what encompasses the fortitude and the courage to take on deep emotional work until their body feels better. I think when someone is absolutely out of energy and you tell someone that they have to start reliving things of the past or that they have to <clears throat> make peace with unresolved issues, if you don't have the physical energy for it, how are you gonna have the emotional and mental energy? So the way I look at it is, if you increase the overall vitality of the body, that body doesn't have um, the ability to stay in, stay in such a low state. And those negative low vibration emotions are going to be forced out because the body ultimately is vibrating higher. You know, if you look at physics, we are actually oscillating frequency fields with voids of space. So we are vibration by virtue of that. And an emotion actually fits into that model because we can have a physiologic thing and we can have a psychologic thing, and you can have a combination between those two things. It's called a psychosomatic defect. I think one of the most interesting examinations of this is when looking at military personnel who have suffered catastrophic injuries when they're deployed, let's say they lose a, you know, half of their arm because an IED went off, they can experience physical pain where there is no limb remaining. And it's called phantom limb syndrome. And one of the, the strategies or the ways to reconcile this is they actually have to look at themselves in the mirror with someone standing behind them so they can see the arm in the mirror that used to be there. And their brain can understand that it's able to let go of that pain because the body holds a memory of such things. So what's wonderful about this, this four-pronged model is when you increase the physical vitality, generally speaking, people have better frames of mind. When people have a better frame of mind, generally speaking, they immerse themselves in higher ascending emotions more so, and it allows them to develop what I would think is a greater spiritual connection to whatever it is they believe, because we all are part of something greater than us. So this concept of mind-body medicine, which ironically is how it was always practiced until you know the Western adaptation of what we do now... I believe is coming to a little bit of a resurgence because it's an absolute necessity if you want to get someone truly well, in my personal opinion. What happens in Western medicine is we do this Western medicine segmentation. So we have our materialists. What are these people? These are the organ and tissue specialists. So you have your nephrologists for the kidneys, you have your gastroenterologists for the gut, you have your immunologists, you have your endocrinologists, and they are incredibly well-intended people who are also very bright, who are following the patterns of a system that was never meant to be inter like totally integrative. An example is a gastroenterologist and an immunologist have a ton of crossover if you believe any of the things we've been talking about regarding the gut and the immune system, the microbiome and inflammation. Do you think in the Western model that it, it is encouraged for the gastroenterologist to share notes with the immunologist do you think either of them know that they may share a common patient? Likely not, because this separatist aspect 
divorces us from having the wisdom to understand the interconnected nature of the body. It's one integrated system. And if we take that to a deeper level, if we have our material specialists, then we have our non-material specialists, which we call mental health specialists. These are the psychiatrists, the psychologists, the psychotherapists, even the social workers. Again, very intelligent, very skilled people, but do you believe that a psychologist or a psychotherapist might say to your client, well, I wonder if your anxiety might be connected to the health of your digestive system? Most people would laugh at that notion, not because it's unbelievable, but because they've never had reason to think about this in a greater degree of lack of skepticism. And they aren't necessarily being paid to be made aware that a certain kind of microbiome phenotype can predispose someone to anxiety in addition to how their nervous system is being regulated by their enteric nervous system. So it's, it's this segmentation that is slowing this whole thing down. And I believe the new wave of health professional totally has to integrate because the idea of this has been upheld for 2,500 years in traditional cultures and practices. And it's only finally hitting the Western world again via the ability to look through this via a scientific lens, which I think has an incredible benefit because we have the ability in some cases to block out the noise of what may be confirmation bias because that can be a very strong deterrent for actual progress in science. But there's also aspects of this that are entirely anecdotal. And I want you to all think of a client in your mind who you may be struggling with. Think of the emotional motives that that client has in their lives. Think of what they bring into your office or on the Zoom call every time you talk to them and they're struggling with their physical health. Do you see any connection or correlation there that might make you want to potentially explore asking this person some more questions or maybe looking at integrating with someone else who's a professional to truly collaborate where both of you stay in your lanes and provide this person a greater degree of service so they can heal themselves. Because fundamentally, it's the person that heals themselves, I believe. It's not the practitioner. We're a guide. So if you look at the traditional practices, and I hope some people on this call or people who are going to watch this eventually are very much steeped in these disciplines, they all correlate and connect everything. So in the Chinese model, excessive emotions act as a stimuli which disturb mind and soul. So two parts of that aspect of the person that we looked at previously in the slides that alters the balance of the internal organs. So they believe that fundamentally excessive emotions can cause vibratory disruptions in an organ, which precedes a physical disruption in the organ. So chronic emotional stress is a cause of illness in the TCM model, why? Because when you perpetually or predominantly bombard an organ with a, a common vibration that is not tuned to health, there's only so much bandwidth of tolerance that that organ has, which we talk about as well. The human body has all these compensation patterns until it loses all of them. So we start at A, and once we get to X or Y, it's pretty scary because we don't have any plans after Z. If the TCM model doesn't work for you, then there's the Ayurvedic model, which is looking at the major doshas. And at first, Ayurveda didn't really resonate with me when I was in school because I thought it was too categorical, you know, oh, you're here or you're here but it really is about the flow between the spectrum. So from an Ayurvedic model, the perspective of emotionally ill health is caused by a lack of coordination by an individual's senses, emotions, and thoughts. So right there, we're looking at ill health being stimulated by the interplay between thoughts, emotions, and actions. So if someone is unable to regulate those things, what chance does their body have to really, you know, resolve the issue and find its way back to health? In this context, they say the heart and the mind are intimately connected. So that coherence, what's called head-heart coherence, which is now being scientifically validated by companies like the HeartMath Institute, we know that the nervous system in the, in the brain isn't the only one in the body. It's the central nervous system, but there are other nervous systems when they're able to synchronize and oscillate frequencies and communicate effectively between them, then the body has an incredible amount of bandwidth for vitality. Because in Ayurveda, the heart is the seat of consciousness. And if you look at what the new wave spiritual movement is talking about, we're trying to open our hearts to things. We're trying to live from a place of love and not be in judgment. So it's interesting that this 2,500 year old plus philosophy was looking at the exact thing which is now being you know, brought around full circle in terms of how we're looking at bringing back health in a truly holistic and systemic matter. 
if you don't like the Ayurvedic model, then you have the chakra model. And I used to poo-poo this stuff so much until I realized that all of a chakra is actually denoting is the concept of what's called an energy center. So each chakra at the center of it has an organ and each chakra has an ability to create a pairing, a, a yin and yang or a masculine feminine pairing. And the coordination and communication through these chakras allows energy to flow properly through the being. And each chakra in and of itself has what's called a shadow motion. So the first chakra, the root, the base one is associated with fear. The second one, your emotional expressive chakra, your creative aspect is associated with guilt. The one I see probably most jammed up with people when I actually use what's called the neural check and I scan them. The third one is your willpower action center. And that one's owned by shame. The fourth, the heart is owned by grief negatively. The fifth, the expressive aspect is owned by lies and when I say own, means you're closed. The six is the illusions, the ability to not see things for what they really are. And the seventh, the one that actually connects us to all that is, is connected with attachment. So there are certain practices, certain frequencies, tones, certain foods, certain supplements that work with these centers. And the thing that really made me look at this as a valid alternative to assessing how someone may be presenting themselves to the world is at the center of each chakra, you have a major organ. And, you know, if you want to go with them, the root is, you know, the base of the spine and the reproductive system, the sacral chakra, the reproductive system, the kidneys and the adrenals. The third one is the stomach, the pancreas, the gallbladder. Fourth one is the heart and the thymus. The fifth is the thyroid. Then you have the pineal and the pituitary. The common theme with all of these organs is they secrete hormones to communicate around the rest of the body and they're all in case centrally where the nervous system runs up the spinal cord so might it be that these things are very very differently describing things that we accept to be generally understood principles within science east and west don't say different things they say the same thing very differently and i think there's an old saying that when you change the way you look at things the things you look at start to change. So for me, looking at mind-body medicine, it can take on a traditional model, but then there's also the, you know, the emotions and the epigenome. We know that if your mother had a traumatic experience and her mother had a traumatic experience, that that can cause epigenetic changes in you, the baby that you're born into or born into the world with, and they predispose your ability to develop your relationship of cognition, emotions, and behaviors. So the epigenetic expressions are passed through. And when you hear the term transgenerational trauma, it's not just talking about emotional traumas. It's not just talking about behavioral habits. It talks about how inf the influence of emotions are strong enough to influence the mitochondrial DNA and the genetic material of that baby on both sides, it's not just the mother. The reason I say maternal is there's more of a strong genetic transfer for, from the maternal side. But nature versus nurture is an interesting conversation here because ultimately what we have to come into the world with predisposes us to likely being a certain way from an emotional or a personality perspective. And that might impede us in our ability to get well if we don't identify those patterns and find ways to unlayer that onion or unravel those things and heal those aspects in ourself, which are non-physical. And this is probably one of the most important parts because this kind of syncs everything together. So in the mind-body medicine perspective, um, and, and this is just a term that I'm, I'm laying out with it, there's emotional communication with the three brains. And the interesting aspect is, you know, science gives rise to the major brain, which is the one floating around in our skulls. And yes, it is the most neuronally dense. It's got 86 billion, think about that for a second, billion neuronal connections. And this is the seat of logic. If you ask someone a question, and this is how I always uh, identify how someone's default way of relating with the world is, if they say, I think, they're using their brain. They're using logic, cognitive associations, and the ability to parse out this and that to make a decision. And what's wonderful about this is when we're not emotional, I think is very, very strategically accurate. And we're great at using an I think model for someone else's problem, because when it's someone else's problem, oftentimes we don't get emotionally involved unless we're a highly empathetic person. So I think is wonderful, but the interesting thing about the brain is I think gives rise to the concept of polarity because there's the solution and then there's either right or wrong, this or that, black and white. 
So when it comes to things that resonate with us, sometimes the brain can become our biggest enemy because we, if we have a little bit of a dysfunctional thought pattern and we don't have good emotional regulation, the logic that we're looking for is very fleeting. So then we have the second brain that everyone knows about. This is the enteric brain or the enteric nervous system. What's interesting about this is if you cut, you sever the vagus nerve, which is the main connection branch from the head brain to the gut brain, this enteric nervous system is still able to function entirely on its own and co intercoordinate its functions. So this is where when you say, oh, I have a gut feeling, this is where this comes from. This brain really does talk to us. And, and think about this as a model. If you were dropped in the wilderness and you had nothing on you and you had no idea where you were, other than whatever knowledge of wilderness survival you may have watched from Bear Grylls, I would not be using my head brain. I would be using a lot of my gut brain because I would be wanting to sense for safety and sense for what it is I feel I need to do in order to conserve my ability to survive. So these two brains talk, but when someone uh, talks a lot in body sensations and feelings, that tells you that they're getting away from the head brain, they're getting into the gut brain or potentially the heart brain. So the gut brain is here, it's talking about self-preservation, mobilization. Your gut is what acts instinctively when you need to be instantaneous in your reactions. You know, if, if someone pulls a knife on you in a back alley, it's your gut brain that's gonna make you move and respond as appropriately to your head going, now, this person is 20 feet away from me. If I start five steps ahead of him, I don't have time to do that kind of stuff. But the heart brain is the most interesting one. The heart brain actually is a bundle of 40,000 different neurons that is conserved very close to the synatrial node in the heart. So it's basically brain tissue, neuronal tissue outside of the brain interacting with the heart. And this is really the area of emotional processing and our connection piece. So when you say, oh, I have an open heart, this is someone who has the ability to think and experience and feel through this brain a lot. And people who have this kind of way of relating with life are highly empathetic. They feel a lot of the things that other people experience in their own way. Having the ability to tap into all of these, I believe, is a human superpower. Our society promotes us to have cognitive intelligence, cognitive consciousness. So the ability to be logical, left brain, analytical, very masculine, not male, masculine in a way of relating with the world. If you can find a way to sync the three of these by learning to drop into yourself, understanding your sense of emotional relationship with emotions themselves, relating with things around you, with the world at large, and feel through your heart rather than think logically emotionless, I think you can actually become someone who can be very beneficial to helping other people heal from their past traumas. So my perspective is only when these three find coherence can we find true health because you remember nervous systems are about communication. Self-communication and is the key to self-regulation and self-identity is knowing that all of these three things are operating in synchronicity. But it is a scientific talk after all, so we do need to bring a little bit of studies and science into this. So this was a study done in Finland, I believe, where they asked just over 700 people to describe the area of the body and the associated intensity of the sensations and the, the sensation style itself in response to the six basic and the six, what do they call more advanced emotions. And these weren't just Finnish people. So this is not, you know, the Scandinavian hardiness of surviving the cold. They brought people from Indonesia. So the polar opposite aspect of not only culture in some ways, but also environmental and geographical life. And the commonality was no matter who they asked, the emotions were felt very similarly. And the color map is um, the most intense is yellow. The absolute most, um, the, the least intense would be blue or black and blue. So if you take a moment to look at these things, look at where a lot of emotions are felt and just you know for a moment, sit with how you process your own emotions. And the one thing that's really interesting is the most powerful and negative emotions and the most powerful positive emotions are felt in some of the same areas. Like happiness and love are the two most powerful positive emotions and anger, pride, and anxiety are the two most powerful negative emotions because they're the ones that drive us to action very quickly. I want you to bring your attention to sadness or depression. If you've ever worked with a depressed person or if you've known a depressed person very closely, if you look into their eyes, it almost looks like all the life is gone from them. Look at the depressed person. They're a shell. 
there's no vitality inside of them. At least when someone's anxious or when someone's, you know, prideful or angry, at least they're experiencing life. I look at depression and sadness. It's like that life force and the desire and the will to live slowly dissipates away. So, you know, all this is to say, you're not going to start asking your clients, point to the doll where you feel this emotion, but understand the implications because where the sensation is, there is energy. Where there is energy, there's influence on the physiology and the tissue. So it's starting to become a little bit more interconnected, at least in my mind, as I'm putting these pieces together. <clears throat> and I think, you know, understanding these two things to understand our own emotional lives and those of the people around us, we do need a deep awareness and the only way to do this is to develop mindfulness and to develop a degree of body intelligence. Because most people walk around, I believe, totally divorced from being able to know how to check in with themselves. They have no or very little ability to trust what feels right for them. And every time they don't trust something that feels right for them and they use logic from what someone else told them it should be, it's actually getting away from being able to be authentically who you really are. So body intelligence is really a, a, a conserved psychological method that highlights the importance of understanding and recognizing body sensations as a way to improve our health because it's not just that we can recognize emotional sensations in our body. If we learn to tap in, we can scan ourselves and feel where our physiology doesn't quite feel right. And then we can start at least digging into that. Why is that? How long has this been there? What is the pattern of this thing? And it can give your client more information, subjective, of course, to relay to you, the professional, so you can do a deeper analysis. You know, so the lost wisdom, I believe, if, if I take everything that I've studied, is like we are the mind-body connection. And emotions are the bridge between proof of that. So the human body and the, is not just the physical tissue. So what the traditional cultures have treated as the way, you know, only recently in medicine, the last hundred years, we divided church and state. We separated physical and mental. And till this day, people like Dr. Gabor Mate, who is an MD, is a physician by trade, is ridiculed by his peers for postulating that people who suffer from rheumatoid arthritis suffer from an inadequacy of managing external life stresses. And this book, I think he's the guy who's probably championing this more than almost anyone right now. This book was incredible at understanding the correlation between personality type, emotional operating systems, and disease patterns, because there are patterns that are likely correlated or conserved across all spectrums of people, regardless of their background or their upbringing when it comes to manifestation of disease. It's a little bit of a history. I want to move to understanding it conceptually, because this is not only for your clients. This is for all of you, in my opinion. And there's an old saying that says, be the change that you want to see. And if we are not able to be our best in terms of our emotional well-being, our emotional health, how can we help people who are trying to do the same without being a little bit hypocritical or at least less informed? So this was a model that was introduced to me years ago by a psychologist who I actually worked with when I was in my late teens. And he told me a basic cognitive behavioral training method that I've never lost. And he said the difference between people who have really good emotional control is they think first, that thought generates a feeling. And once they can relate with that feeling, they perform an action. So that's a way of saying we have our internal emotions in check. When people have divorced themselves from the ability to positively emotionally regulate or relate with themselves... Anytime they feel something, they act instantaneously. If someone's a substance uh, addict, they're typically indulging an action based upon a drive, a desire, a feeling that they need. And then, then after the fact, after the action, they think about what they did. And oftentimes it's with regret because they're stuck in a pattern. I've realized this, when you are in a highly emotional state, you can literally kiss goodbye to logic and clear thinking. It takes an instant vacation only to return once you've calmed down and processed your experience. So to me, it's not that the emotion is affecting us. We become the emotion. The emotion owns us and it operates until we allow it to dissipate. Because emotions themselves are pure. They're not thoughts. They're not parallel. It's not like when you have a thought, you can go, oh, well, this is the positive outcome. This is the negative outcome. You don't experience happiness and sadness simultaneously and turn a dial to figure out what your ratio is. 
you experience emotion as a pure thing. And here's the hard part. What brings joy for one person may bring sorrow for another. And that's the subjective bias of our reality and our worldview that allows us to interpret one specific example differently to create a different emotional outcome. So to understand your emotions, it means that you have to understand your operating system. You cannot understand how an iPhone works without understanding what an app is. And all the apps are just operating based upon the iOS software system. And they're talking back and forth to the system to allow them to run. I look at emotions very similarly. Each of us has a certain way we're wired. We have a, a, an inclination to certain personality traits, certain emotional manifestations, and we have um, an avoidance or you know, a little bit of an aversion to others. Unless we know how we operate, we don't know how we relate with emotions. Deeper level is if you go a little bit deeper in, you'll understand that where most of your ways of relating with these things come from are based upon how you were brought up and the things you were told. Because when we're children below the age of eight, the dominant brain wave that we walk around in is a theta wave state. And if you know anything about the brain waves, they influence how our brain internalizes and processes information. So theta is a little bit more like hypnosis. If you've ever seen someone who's been hypnotized and is being told to cluck like a chicken, their brain wave states have been lulled into a dominant state and they're highly suggestible. Children don't experience the world around us as like an observer watching a movie. Children imbibe the world around us. And it's taken me a, a lot of <laughs> internal honesty to look at where the things that powered up my perspectives of how the world should be, how, how I should look at things, what I think is right, what I think is wrong. Those things are given to us from our upbringing, the people that we're closest to, the people that have authority over us. And then when we take a step back, we see how we're symbolically wired and symbolically activated. So if you want to get someone emotionally charged, disagree with them on the concept of religion or politics or culture, or even tell them that their most passionate personal interest is a stupid endeavor. I guarantee you that's a shortcut way to a fight. But what you're really doing there is you're stimulating what makes that person emotional. So you're getting to understand how they're wired and what makes them tick. So the interesting thing about humans is what makes us emotional um, makes us fight for our beliefs. It kind of instantly turns us into martyrs. And what perpetuates that in stark disagreement with others never allows us to come closer together as a population, as a society. It creates divide. And when humans are divided, they're easily controlled, they're weak. So emotional experiences, understand this in my opinion, are always temporary or isolated events. You get a piece of good news, you get happy, and then you have that piece of news, which you can experience again in your mind, but that was an instant moment in time. I look at those as emotional experiences. Emotional patterns, which is something that can be a repeat process, are more so ingrained through a thought or a memory. And these things are held dormant until they're reactivated. So think about if you've ever inadvertently triggered someone by saying the wrong thing. You say something, and this person just absolutely loses it. And in, in your mind, you're going, what did I say? I just... Ooh. It was never about what you said. It was about what you activated in them that has been conserved, that your way of saying things was the trigger. Essentially, you inadvertently poke the bear. And this pattern will likely be conserved into someone until they figure out how to move it, clear it, or totally unwind themselves from being owned by this emotional pattern. And there's a really good book called The Body Keeps the Score that understands what happens when people are going through trauma and how you have to relate with and heal trauma because until it's dealt with, I believe it's conserved. And if that frequency is moving around your field and that frequency is in stark contrast to the direction you wanna go, it's also gonna be the rate limiting step to your ability to achieve a higher state of health across the board as a person. So emotions as, our, as, as a way to relate to our health are a really important talking point. And, and these are questions that I think we should all ask ourselves. What emotions do you re relate with predominantly in your waking reality? When you get quiet, what is it you feel most often? Or what thoughts come into your mind? And what is the, the flavor of the thought? Is it something on the descending list? What emotions are easily triggered in us subconsciously? You know, are, are we someone who's quick to anger? Are we someone who's you know, very joyful when someone in our world is doing really well, even at the expense of us not doing, you know, as well as them. Understanding that stuff 
lets us get into our subconscious minds, which really is 90 to 95 percent of what's going on. I mean, I'm going to bring this all to your attention. You're sitting here listening to me. So your conscious mind is distracted by the sound of my voice, the funky lights that I put on in my background, obviously, and then obviously the slide up on the page. But your subconscious is still thinking about other things, which means a part of you is not fully here. And whatever that background noise is, is what predominates your subconscious waking reality. And what emotions do you feel towards the world, things, people outside of us? Because if you're quick to judge, if you're quick to make a positive and negative, if you're quick to take the wind out of someone's sails, it also says a lot about where you are. And then the most important question, which is emboldened here, is what emotions do you reflect internally? And this is what I do believe. If we can't find self-love and love for our existence, we can't be healthy because that's an inside job. We think that people outside of us can provide us love, which of course they can. But I believe that you know our internal reality is mirror projected outside of us. So what we have internally will be projected and acted out by the people outside of us. And this is a huge area of opportunity because this instantly never allows you, in my opinion, to be a victim of anything because everything can be seen as your creation. And when you start to do the internal work and reflect more positively inside of yourself, guess what? The outside world shows you the same thing, but there's more to it. If you start to do the internal work and reflect things positively inside of yourself, all of a sudden, if you love yourself, will your body maybe feel better? Will your symptoms start to ameliorate themselves? Will you potentially start to express a greater degree of physical health because emotionally and mentally you are in a better place? I think absolutely. So defining our relationship with emotions, and I won't go into this uh, too much, but this is a, a very basic premise and principle that, that I look with. It's sitting with emotions, meaning if you are feeling emotional, don't deny it because it's there for a reason. It's there to teach you something and it's there to tell you something, to make you aware. And you need to fully express that emotion or else you're going to do what most men do is they just stuff it deep down. It's like taking a bag of garbage, throwing it in the closet and shutting the door. Garbage bag gone. Yes, the garbage bag is gone. But what happens in a week when it starts to stink? So expressing those emotions is essential to not hold more garbage, but expressing those emotions at the person who may have triggered them might not be the best thing because you might create a negative dynamic that starts something different. That person is just showing you what the opportunity inside yourself is to process and understand the emotion. And then fundamentally, it's the simple act of letting go. And I say simple tongue in cheek because um, there's an old saying that I like to say, simple and easy aren't synonyms. So it is a process. But if you know how your patterns are wired and you know that this is an internal job rooted in mindfulness and awareness, and you can really understand that you can move mountains inside of yourself, but to the outside objective world, it may seem that nothing else has changed. So what does go on in the physical side of things? You know, where do emotions come from? Well, people say, oh, it's the limbic system. It's like, well, the limbic system is a structure in the brain that allows us to experience the aspect of emotion that, you know, we can. It allows us to distinguish happiness from sadness, so on and so forth. And having a functional limbic system, which is the thalamus, amygdala, hippocampus, and hypothalamus, the interconnected point between the, the four, having a healthy amygdala is essential. So if someone is dealing with gut inflammation, you're likely dealing with brain inflammation, you're likely dealing with autonomic nervous system dysregulation. So someone's emotional irregularities may actually be compounded or strongly highlighted by some physiologic issue that we could call neuronal inflammation. But understand that this is where information gets processed. It comes in the afferent and efferent pathways of the nervous system allow us to intake information. The brain, which is the grand you know, processor, interprets the signals, which if you really think about it, are nothing more than vibratory waves. Like our ability to express feel and express emotion is nothing more than electrochemical signals going up nerve signals, down, back out nerve signals, and we express the behavior all via the firing on and off in sequence of nerves in, in our brain. So think about that for a second. The experience of emotions are actually somewhat like binary code of the flashing sequence of a neuron turning on and off in relation with other neurons. But this is how we're able to experience emotions. This is not where emotions come from, but I want to highlight the fact that 
if the physical tissue is unhealthy, which kind of strengthens my initial theory, the physical tissue is unhealthy, how do we expect to be at our mental and emotional best? Because we know that there is a very strong connection between the axes of communication. And the one thing that comes back to this is how the nervous systems interrelate and communicate with each other. If we have issues at a gut level, if we have a gut microbiome that is dysbiotic, then all of a sudden the modulation of our autonomic nervous system is going to change our enteric nervous system. If that breakdown of things like motility and secretions of digestive enzymes and hydrochloric acid are downregulated, then we're going to have an increased level of permeability in our guts. We're not going to move nutrition through our system as effectively, and we're not going to move waste out of our system as frequently. And then as a result of that, we're going to dysregulate the entire human body because one system has the ability to cause causal changes in all other aspects. If you look at Chinese medicine, for example, they'll say, well, if someone is experiencing grief, it's going to negatively affect the lungs, but the lungs counter-regulatory organ is the colon. So if they're unable to release their bowels, not only are they, are they not physically processing waste, they're likely not mentally and emotionally processing these wastes, which is why they needle various meridian channels to try to stimulate peristalsis and get the bowels moving again. So, you know, research is also starting to look at these questions and these concepts, and they're trying to design studies around, can we correlate X with Y? So emotional well-being and gut microbiome profiles by enterotype. And an enterotype is um, the, the, the patterns of the coming together of a community of microbes in, in a specific system. So this was a, a study done in, I believe it was South Korea. So their, their findings were together, the current findings highlight the enterotype specific links between the gut microbiota community and emotion in healthy adults and suggest the possible roles of gut microbiome in promoting mental health. So think about this. If we are nothing more than the ultimate expression of all the systems coming together, is it possible that our gut microbes also have the ability to influence how our enteric nervous system experiences emotion? Can it cut us off from our own gut feeling? Can dysbiosis potentially drive negative abilities to trust ourselves because we've lost that sense of gut feeling inside of us? I believe it's true. Because generally speaking, when you find someone with severe dysbiosis, they probably don't have the greatest motivation and feeling about themselves in life because they feel so terrible all the time. So when it comes to working on our emotional fitness, there are a multitude of different ways. I'm going to briefly touch on these as jumping off points. And, you know, we can leave some time at the end for questions if people want to stay a little bit longer and ask some personal questions. I believe this is the most important of, you know, most interpersonal important of all journeys is you have to understand the process of the, the, the emotions within and how you relate to them. So if you can become the observer of yourself, you soon start to realize what makes you emotional and it gives you an opportunity to get on top of those emotions so you break the cycle of what may be causing distress, disharmony in your life. Understanding all emotions are temporary. And it's essential to honor them, to feel them, but hopefully not to hold them because they will teach you so much about yourself. We live in a world where IQ is highly prioritized and prized, but other parts of the world where EQ is more of a, a default operating system, I think has an incredible amount of benefit because if you can pair the analytical mind with emotional intelligence, you become an incredibly powerful person to help yourself. And once you've helped yourself, you can help others. So you want to enhance your connection to your inner world. Be able to understand your own patterns, tap into yourself, and these show you what I call your shadows. You know, it stops you from this yo-yo of getting stuck in these cycles of where it's like, oh my God, I'm regretting my behavior. Okay, I understood what I did. Then you fall into it again. You go, oh, I'm regretting my behavior. That's the up and down cycle. And the problem with those is eventually you lose steam. You lose the ability to keep persisting because every failure, it's a chance to reflect negatively, negatively sorry, negatively inwardly. So if you understand yourself from the observer concept, it lets you know that doing the shadow work inside of you only yields positive things because although shining a light on some dark stuff can be painful momentarily, it always leads to a prosperous end goal. And when it comes to the different options and opportunities, any of these things on this list can be uh, an essential piece of the puzzle at a certain moment in time. What I mean by that is there are times where clinical therapy and 
cognitive behavioral training may be the thing that someone needs. But other times it may be something like mindfulness, meditation, and prayer. But if someone has a hard time sitting still, maybe they need to pair it with movement because moving the body helps them relate with the breath, which helps them move things out. So on the low intensity side, you have things like yoga, qigong, tai chi, or you can just go to the gym as a way of, you know, initial coping while you're figuring out how you want to approach these things. Acupuncture, breath work, even psychedelic therapy, you know, ketamine infusions are being done in doctor's offices. Psilocybin is starting to become legalized in specific areas. So understanding that these are tools that can help us reframe conserved emotional patterns. And when the ego, which is what psychedelic therapy can influence, when the ego is potentially slightly blocked or dissuade from being in control, it gives you the opportunity to look at a perspective with a different set of eyes so you can elicit a different emotional response. So lots of technology that I've used very frequently in my, my practice, something like BrainTap, which we just talked with Dr. Patrick Porter, tracking heart rate variability is wonderful because the nervous system never lies. There's a, a tool called Neural Check that clips to your wrist. It allows you to plot a lot of information as it relates to how the heart is regulating each individual beat. And then using things like sound therapy, be it crystal bowls, specific frequencies can be tuned to the certain aspects of the body. And then just doubling down on physical well being, you know, making a point of caring enough about yourself and making it very um, prioritized that your physical health never takes a backseat to something else because that's compromise. And if you're in the game of perpetually compromising, you can never make lasting facilitating change. It's an old saying that says short-term motivation leads to failure. How do you implement these things in a sustainable manner? The last thing is being radically honest with yourself. So if you're not radically honest with yourself, that's where the illusion comes in. And ultimately, if you want to make a change, sometimes you have to see things for what they are, not what you want them to be. So when it comes to the physiologic approach, how do we approach it within the, the Master Supplements U.S. Enzymes catalog? We have to understand that this bottom-up, top-down context has been you know, heavily encouraged in our, our system's thinking because it can be looked at in a, an emotional or a mental context where it's like, oh, the stress is there, I'm identifying it, and I'm understanding my physiologic response. So when it comes to emotions, we have to know this stuff to be well-rounded but we also need to stay in our lanes um, as physical health professionals at our core and give someone an intervention that may be synergistic. So it's top down, bottom up. If we have good mental health, we likely have good gut health. And if we have good gut health, we have to have healthy microbiota. So when I'm looking at a top down intervention, I still bring it back to the master philosophy because, you know, if someone is extremely mentally disturbed, I don't think they have a hope in hell of having a strong functioning digestive system. So everyone on the planet needs to eat no matter what condition they're dealing with. Make them more able to break down the food that they need and make the necessary food changes to get the garbage out of their diet so that you're not perpetuating the potential problem. May it be sourced from food sensitivities, legit food allergies, the ingestion of toxins and the ingestion of highly processed foods and preserved foods. Once that's taken care of, we have two remaining aspects. We can look at the bottom up aspect and we have probiotics and prebiotics. And we've talked about this at length. We can focus on different segments of the digestive system when you get to know the different products in the portfolio. If you assume it to be a primarily colonic thing, then you can start with true bifido, but you don't need to throw the baby out with the bathwater if true bifido doesn't work. Maybe it's Theralac Pro that they needed because it was predominantly colonic, but it was you know, small intestine as well. The other aspect is true. Typically people who have things that are emotional mental disturbances, I find have dysbiosis, candida, parasites. So maybe they need you know, a good solid HCL plus enzyme, true flora and a cleanzyme because you want to clean out the disturbed material in their physiologic tissue. And then you know that inflammation is always part and parcel of all this stuff because if you have a leaky gut, you likely have a leaky brain, which means you have toxic material floating around in your circulatory systems. So we have the modulators of inflammation. Youthzyme, I think one of the most underutilized products that we have is a powerful modulator of systemic inflammation. Betazyme helps to entrain the immune system, hopefully to be more tolerant of things. You can use sulforazyme strategically. And all of our proteolytic enzymes have the ability or the influence to be able to target specific areas of the body. 
But what about beyond the physical aspect? What can we bring from this lecture into the clinical side of things? Well, if you're not a mental health professional and you don't feel comfortable giving advice, the cool part is you don't need to talk. Let your client or your patient tell you their story. Let them talk. And when they're talking, start making specific correlations. Start asking them, you know, like, did you notice that the onset of these symptoms really intensified after this big life event? See if they can start giving you some more information that maybe you weren't able to get in your screening process or your screening process didn't necessarily have enough insight into this to ask specific questions. Have the, has the client ever seen patterns between their emotions and what their body does? Do they have diarrhea that follows a highly stressful period at work? Or when they get into a fight with their significant other, do they start to get constipated? Are they holding this? Are there unidentified triggers in their life that connect to their illness? You know, it's like, oh, did I have something that happened to me when I was 16 that I totally forgot about and I've never actually been able to revisit it? And as I'm getting closer to dealing with my illness, maybe I'm having to go back and deal with some of my past and understand what's psychosomatic. It's very easy to trigger a psychosomatic response in someone. And a lot of times people's physical things are more psychologically conserved than they are physical drivers, but because they can feel them in their body, they think it's purely physical. The other aspect is building what I call a health commune. You know, we are so segmented in our practice. And what's wonderful about our practice of health is we have individual expression but we can't be everything to everyone. You know, you can be a good generalist. My practice is I'm entirely a generalist at this point. My specialty is having no specialty because I'm into the interconnectedness of the human body. And I study things not to know them to their absolute death, but to know how they relate to everything else. So how can you collaborate with a complementary health professional, not someone to replace you, but someone to provide a greater insight into something you may not be well-trained in to have a greater impact to ultimately provide value to your clients and patients, because this is really all about health and healing. If we can start to incorporate some of these things, I believe we push the boundaries of medicine beyond where they're currently stuck, and we start practicing what I think is true holistic medicine. So don't be like Ron Burgundy. Don't keep yourself encased in a glass case of emotion. Let it out, although he did do a pretty good job letting it out in that moment. Remember, milk is a bad choice. And with that, everyone, I thank you for your time. Oh, wow. 5.59 to the minute. That was just a happy, happy accident. <laughs> nice work. Thank you, sir. I see we have a couple questions. No, we don't have a couple questions. I just was not, I was not watching the chat because I wasn't busy being off somewhere channeling information. <laughs> you were in the flow, the zone, man. All right. Well, does um, anyone have any questions? I, I have a few minutes if anyone wants to ask any questions to kind of a speak now forever hold your peace thing. But um, yeah, I want to thank everyone. We have uh, we have our masterclass this month surrounding emotional fitness, Jeff. So what's that one all about? What's the date for that one? So it is April 25th and Karen Mullins, who's uh, um, I, I want to say the digestive warrior, just I know that she actually has the the website, The Digestive Warrior, and her story, um, we certainly have a lot of customers um, who um, who are coming from, you know, a similar background, a personal health journey that took them down one road on the like allopathic approach, um, you know, I don't, and I don't want to preface too much, but just, you know, for anyone, um, and she's got a great, uh, um, you know, following and messaging, you know, aligns with us, um, and everything we've been talking about for these past two years. So excited to hear more about her story. Um, anyone can check her out in the meantime. It's like at Digestive Warrior um, on Instagram. And um, she got a YouTube channel. She's but that'll the be at the Digestive end of the Warrior. Right? The, the Digestive the, Warrior. She's like the yes. Highlander. There can only be one. <laughs> um, so yeah, April 25th uh, at 6 p.m. Um, Central Time for that one. Um, if you're in the Nashville area, please join us. We have an in-person event in Nashville um, the week of the 21st, um, the weekend of the 21st. Roland will be there himself. Even if you're not in Nashville, it's not too late to fly in. And you can cool email city. us. Good food, good music. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, also, I guess uh, we'll give a shout out to the, the CDID event. Um, uh, it's like the ACA group, the 
um, Council. Oh man, I'm going to botch their their acronym. Sorry, guys, but uh, we're a proud exhibitor and sponsor and working with them again this year. So we'll be down in Texas for that one. I think Austin on the 14th and 15th. So thank Sweet. you everyone for joining. We'll have rolling slides that uh, that were on here yeah. and uh, the immediate recording from Zoom as soon as uh, it, everything is downloaded. Sent out Next month, Apple. we're back for physical fitness. I'm returned to my original form. So I'm, I'm excited for that. So as, ever, as always, thank you everyone. We'll hope to see you next month. And Jeff, thank you for hosting as always. Awesome. Thank you. All right, guys. Till next time. Mm -hmm.